<laughs> this is a really simple song. I am opening up. Now we're going to open up ourselves to this wonderful service, this wonderful day with this wonderful energy that we're creating all together. If you can't get the first line, it's I'm opening up in sweet surrender to the luminous love light of the one. That's all it is. And then we open up. I am opening up in sweet surrender to the luminous love light of the one. I am opening up in sweet surrender to the luminous love light of the one. I am opening. I am opening. I am opening. I am opening. Take it deeper now. I am opening up in sweet surrender to the luminous love light of the one. I am opening up in sweet surrender to the luminous love light. How are you doing? Yay, good. It's good to be here. You're right. I had kind of a mess. Of a, oh, just have to have my reveal thing. Yep, it's here. Reveal. Da 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 you know what, I, I, I'm always a little um, different when I come back from a trip. I think it's just the rest and the elevated consciousness being with a group of people when we go on a spiritual journey and we do spiritual work together and it just feeds my soul. So I get a little crazy when I'm back. So what can I say about Ireland? Ireland, they have really good food. They are foodies, surprise, surprise. I thought they would be much more like the English so much foodies. Anyway, so they are foodies. It was wonderful. They are incredibly spiritual. They're really into spirit. Um, I was there on a Thursday in Dublin. No, Wednesday, Friday in Dublin. And uh, I was, it wasn't even the St. Patrick's Cathedral. I, I took a tour. I was trying to go to St. Cat Patrick's Cathedral on Sunday. And the line goes around the block to get in to the cathedral. On Friday, I go to this little place that takes only three blocks, uh, a Carmelite church. They had seven masses, seven masses on a Friday. Those people are in spirit. That and pubs. <laughs> I'll tell you, it's spiritual all the way. <laughs> so you go to a little town, it's a pub, grocery store, pub, uh, sweater shop pub, more sweater shop pub. It's just amazing. It's wonderful. 
that. I mean, so I loved the place. It was really great. Uh, uh, I, I will probably, uh, I, want to t I want to go again, uh, take Tim. I think he would really enjoy it. And it's beautiful. The grass is green like I've never, ever seen green grass. Never seen grass like that before. It, it's iridescent. It vibrates with green. I think, like we don't really know what they're doing with all this, the waste from um, Hanford, but it might be in Ireland. <laughs> because it's fluorescent, like vibrates green. Just saying. Well, you know, because you look at this, like how to get that green. This is fall. Anyway, so enough of that. Uh, I will be sharing with you today uh, some really, really good news because right before I went to uh, Ireland, uh, we made an offer on a piece of property and they accepted the offer. Yes. And I want to tell you about it. But I also have to say that there could be weird stuff happen to it. I mean, you never know. How many of you ever bought a house and then you did the inspection? <laughs> and how many after the inspection? <laughs> well, we're going through the inspection stage, but so far it looks like everything is, there's nothing buried underneath. We don't, th so it's, I think we're good to go. I think we're good to go. Uh, and I'll tell you about that. But before I do that, I, um, I want to get back to a story. Because this, um, a bunch of stories. Stories are good. I could give you facts about your soul. I could tell you that you're one with God. And the only thing that keeps you from your acknowledgement of that oneness is some beliefs you have. And you'd all go, yeah, that's right. But since consciousness is cause, sometimes facts don't go into that deeper area of consciousness that we call the subjective. What goes into the deeper area of your soul, which we call the subjective, is a story. So a story relates to things that, that will shift us more than just having more facts. I could say there's nothing that keeps you from your good except your own stinking thinking, and you'd go, yeah, that's right. What's stinking thinking? It's sometimes hard to grasp in our logical mind. So I want to go back to the story that I've been sharing. It's a story, it's a myth that comes from our uh, Judeo-Christian tradition. And it's the, the story of the children of Israel leaving Egypt and the bondage that Egypt represented because they were slaves. They left not just Egypt, they left slavery. Egypt's a nice place. I like going there, but I would not want to be a slave there. So they left that. And then they had this interim place. Now, why did they have an interim place? There's a lot of reasons. Uh, none of them make sense. <laughs> so it had to be that there had to be a shift internally. If it's the myth, it's this internal shift. So I didn't tell you part of the story. Moses, after getting all the, all the children out, the Israelites, the, the tribe out, and they're camping in the Sinai. Not such a great place to spend a lot of time, by the way. So they're camping in the Sinai, and the Spirit of God leads Moses over to this cliff, this big plateau, and he sees this beautiful green valley, this beautiful, gorgeous, probably looked like Ireland, uh, <laughs> green that vibrated, and trees, and, and, and crops, and he goes, whoa, and green, and green uh, lush things, and a river running through it. No, but it wasn't that movie. And um, it was wonderful. And he goes, wow, that's great. I'll see if it's okay to go there. See, God says, go there. And he says, no, I'll, I'll, I'll handle this now. I, I, I see this dream. I can handle this now. So out of the 12 tribes, he sends one person from each tribe. He sends them in two. So six, six couples or pairs go into the promised land. So that they can get a read on how easy it would be to, to move into that land and take it over. Ten come back and say, that's horrible. They're, they're giants. They have weapons I've never seen before. It'll be impossible. 
Joshua, on the other hand, and his partner come back and go, wow, the vegetables, the fruit, the fertility, we'll have fat cattle, it'll be wonderful, there's fish in the stream, it's going to be beautiful. Two of them saw how positive that end would be, and ten of them saw the reasons they couldn't do it. Now, I'm sorry, this is just too good a metaphor. <laughs> how many of you are given a dream or, or see something, it's almost like something just comes to you. You get an inspiration. I could do this. And then part of the committee <laughs> decides it will evaluate your dream for you. And you get real logical. And the committee goes into the future and says, no, we can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, which is what was happening there. And so according to the story, the spirit says, well, since you didn't take my word for it that you could, you could own this land, you could have that dream, you can't move in until all of the naysayers have died off, which is why it took 40 years. The naysayers had to go. In our own consciousness, we can't own the dream, own the dream. We might visit the dream. Our cousin gets the dream. <laughs> oh, and our neighbor got the dream. But we, we can't own the dream until the naysaying is gone. And I'll give you an illustration. How many of you have pushed yourself into something you weren't ready for? Like, you pushed yourself into the promotion. You pushed yourself into that job. You pushed yourself into the relationship. You pushed yourself. I know people who pushed themselves into a house. We pushed ourselves into a large facility. But we didn't really own it in consciousness because we were in debt. You know you don't own it in consciousness if it's a burden. Does that make sense? So we have an opportunity to, as, a, as a group of people to spend this time together owning our dream, you owning your dream. So it's not a push. It's not a, oh, I got to make this happen. It's like a natural thing. It becomes easy because when we have the consciousness of a thing, we can't keep the thing from us. If you want to know what your consciousness is, what's the thing in front of you? If you don't like that thing, you change your consciousness, Ernest Holmes, our teaching. So um, I really want to support you and, and I'm, I'm in just a few minutes, I'm going to open this up to questions and questions, and hopefully I have an answer. I was really grateful to first service. We had three people ask really good questions that I think have probably been on everyone's mind at some time. So if you have a question, don't think it's silly or stupid or inappropriate because guess what? Somebody in this room has the same question. And also feel free to ask because I've noticed that one person finally would ask, raise their hand, and then right when we were running out of time, two more wanted to talk. So. Get this hand ready. <laughs> just get it, get it ready. In fact, actually, it might just pop up and you go, well, what was that question? It's all right. But before I do that, I, you've got a question. But before I do that, I, I want to give you an example. I've been, you know, I guess because I'm a minister, I've been told that I should write a book. And I did some, the 40 days, and those were more like spiritual practices. But I was told, you know, you need to write a book. You need to write a book. But I didn't see anything out there that needed to be said. Anything that I would talk about, other people have written and done it very well. So why, why spend the time to write a book? It's done. But there's something, there's some technology that I've noticed has, is not being written about. So there's a technology that I use that isn't being told about, and I thought, well, I could write a book on that. In fact, actually, I'm, I was kind of got the... <laughs> <laughs> write a book on that. <laughs> and all of the reasons why I shouldn't write that book show up. The time, the energy, the, the who would edit, blah, 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 blah. And the naysayers 
have a lot more sway right now than the vision does. So if you have a dream and you have naysayers, let's use this time while we're going to be here, while we're in transition, while we've got our tent here, let's use this to release the I can't so that we will naturally move into the I can. Because if I started to write a book and I say I can't, how miserable would that be? And how hard? And I don't want to live a hard life anymore. I don't want to prove how good the book is because I worked so hard on it. I just, if it can't be a beautiful expression of who I am, then it's not worth it because life is every moment. Does that make sense? So this is a great time for us to do some things together, to create some visions together. So with that said, we have uh, people with mics. We have Sherry and a uh, senior ministerial student, <laughs> Jerry Hudson. <laughs> and, and one day we'll be a practitioner, uh, Sherry Glasso. Well, she does not, we don't know what year, but <laughs> she knows eventually. She's been saying this for what, 20 years? Yeah, okay, someday it's gonna happen. All right, so who has any questions? Okay, right here first. Okay, could you explain grace to me? Ah, oh, I love grace. It is the free givingness of God. It is absolutely unearned blessing. Unearned. Let's just put it this way. You don't deserve it. <laughs> now here, now this, now this is important. It doesn't mean, what that means is that it, you have to get that God gives to you whether you are good enough or not. Do you see that, the difference? Because if we, in our own mentality, we judge ourselves so much that we think we can't have a thing, we can't be blessed until we've somehow been good enough, earned enough, worked enough, studied enough. It's, it's just the free givingness of God. We, it's not earned. It's not deserved because... It's like the rain. Does this land deserve it more than that land? No, it just rains where it rains. And, um, and the Sinai deserves it just as much as, as Palestine, but it just rains. So it can't, we, can't, we can't think to ourselves, I did this, therefore I do not deserve. God just gives. And the only thing that stops that giving is our receptivity. So that's why I say you don't deserve it. Because if we say we have to deserve it, do you see how that's going to set some stuff up in our head? Like, well, what do I do to finally deserve it? And that's a, that's a, a hamster wheel that you just can't get off. Does that answer your question? Who else has ever wondered what grace was? That was perfect. So we have a, uh, right over here, well, let's take this side now. Right back there, Sherry. And the, you no, know, you just turned around. You had your hand. No, yes, you had your hand up. No, I was going to ask the same question. As grace? <laughs> Whoa, I love it. What are the odds? Okay, yeah. Odds uh, Odds. What are the odds? So you're, you're talking about moving into a promised land, and I've been going through something similar in, in my career, and I'm curious, how do we know enough of the naysayers have died? When, when is it time to leave the liminal <laughs> space and move on? When it will seem natural, when it seems natural without having to effort to accept, when it seems natural to talk, when it seems natural to apply, when it seems natural to move ahead, when it seems natural to like look for other jobs, I mean look for other jobs, or so when it se seems natural to uh, say something. Does that make sense? Because that is, be, you're there. You're, it's just natural to do it. If you're still trying, I'm going to make this work, you're not there yet. And I will give you a, 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 a formula for doing that, that I gave first service. So, um, if write down what you don't have that you want on a piece of paper. And what, the way I like to do it is I like to do it in a journal so I can look back at it. 
So in my journal, I'll write at the top of the page, I want to have, but I don't. And then I write all the reasons I don't. Now those are reasons will seem very factual and really smart. Like, boy, I'm smart, this is why I do if, if I do that, and I look at it, and I really look at these reasons that I've just written down quickly, some of them I'll see aren't quite, they don't have a lot of weight, so I'll just start to cross them out. And I do that every night. Everything I've really wanted to move into, I'd do it every night. And I notice that the reasons, when you look at them, what you're doing is you're giving light to them, and the lies start to dissipate. They just lose their power. So every night I notice I'd have less and less and less reasons. Because I was looking at them, and it's like, they just sort of like, they have no power. I didn't want to write them down. And then eventually I'd get to one or two that had their grip. Then I have to say something more like this. Is this really true of God? If it's not true of God, it's not true of me. And if I couldn't, after a couple of nights, release them that way, that's when I would call a prayer practitioner or my prayer partner and say, I'd like you to help me see the truth of these things, that they're, they're something I made up and not eternally true. They're not eternally true. I mean, one illustration is when I wanted to get married again, one of the things that I wrote down is uh, men don't want to date ministers. <laughs> and it was true for me. I mean, you know, why would you want to meet? I, I have a date on, I have a standing date on Saturday night. <laughs> you know, weekends are really a, a bust, <laughs> you know? Uh, and I really had to, to, I kept writing it down, I writing it down and writing it down. And then finally, I just had to come to this place of, can God find someone who's willing to date a minister in all of the billions of men in the world? Is there one? <laughs> and when I could get to the place where there was probably one, I could cross that thing out. And that's when I could discover Tim who worked weekends. <laughs> Does this make sense how that works? All right. Oh, look at the hands are starting to fly. All right, so yeah, we've got a question right over there. Thank you. How do you know when the thing that is pulling you is a genuine dream that you want to accomplish or when it's just kind of a should, something you feel you should do? Very good question. And that really, there's two things that you can do. You can get with a, a prayer practitioner who won't tell you what's right, like, oh yeah, you don't want that. They would never do that. But they will help you get clear on your own personal truth because I think we've all gone towards those things that we think we should do. But here's what guides me, and when I'm looking at somebody, what helps me guide them is pay attention to your body. The body cannot lie. So if you say you want something and there's resistance in your body, it's probably not your heart's desire. And when you finally name the thing you really want, what your heart wants, you can't keep the smile off your face. You can't. I watch it every time. People will say things. Yeah, I really want to. Really? Yeah, I really want to. <laughs> really? Tell me more. <laughs> I don't think that's the truth. Is it true? <laughs> no, I don't think it's the truth. What do you really want? I really want to have <laughs> So, Look in the mirror, get a friend, take them to coffee, and they'll tell you if you're telling yourself the truth. Um, I think what I'm trying to do is make too big of a leap from where I am to where I want to be. Um, I have this big dream of what's actually possible in education, and I want to be a leader in that, and I already am. Um, and I want that to be my right livelihood. And I feel like, well, you gotta take the baby steps and you know, do all these other things before you can actually get there. And every time I try to do that, it, like I went in for an interview to be a head of school and they were like, you're overqualified. <laughs> so like, how do I find that 
the next step, or I just feel like I'm trying to make a giant leap. Yes, you are. So do what, write down all the reasons why you aren't there. Oh, okay. It's not, it's not the baby steps, it's do all the reasons. Because when you finally let all those go, every baby step will be delightful. You're like, oh, I can't wait to do this. What keeps you from moving and, 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 and then evaluating is not good enough the baby steps is that you've got a whole bunch of stuff in your subjective that is like, uh, I can't do this, so let's hate the baby steps because it might get me there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we have time for just two more. Good morning. You look beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Right? Oh, you got it. Yeah. That's true. Um, so when we are being led in what feels like the absolute right direction and we bump up against a situation and the experience of discomfort and pain comes, is that the ego or the soul? <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I should, just a second. Uh, Karnak. <laughs> You know, one of the reasons that we have wonderful prayer practitioners is they help you untangle those questions. Because if there was, if this were simple and you didn't have to really do some introspection, everybody would be here. There was a gentleman who went through a seminary in, um, it was in the Bay Area, and it was run at, the, run by, at that time by uh, Matthew Fox. And when he said that he was uh, uh, a science of mind, uh, practitioner, because he was a practitioner, but he was going to seminary to learn more. One of the people at the seminary said, oh my goodness, that's the hardest religion in the world, because there's less rules. Do you see how hard it is? There's less rules, less things to bump up against that tell you what to do or not. You really have to own your own authority. That's tough. See, people can be spiritual, and it's really easy. You do this, do 12 Hail Marys. You do that, do, I don't know, whatever. Uh, here you're wrong, here you're good. Man, w w we really get to do the terrain, but in that you discover yourself, and when you discover yourself, you discover the capital S self, which means you discover your God. Nobody can give you that. What a wonderful opportunity. That the, the introspective research within your own thinking process can only lead you to your God. Because that's all there is. Otherwise, like Emerson would say, you would have a second-hand God. And you don't want a second-hand God. And if I could tell you, oh yeah, it's this or this or this, if I ever start to do that, you need to get rid of me. <laughs> because no one should do that to anybody. To take away your opportunity to discover your truth now, it doesn't mean in a collective group that truth is easy, it's easier to find. And we can give you techniques, but we can't tell you what is yours. So that's why we do this thing called worship, which is what we do when we come together, because collective consciousness, it's easier for things to bubble up. So I've, uh, I have time for one short one, easy one. If you don't, if it's... <laughs> It's not easy, I can't do it. Right back here. Oh, right, right back there. Right, right, right. One short, oh, hi. <laughs> because I have something that I want to share with you. In the, pro in the process of letting go uh, of attachment and just process of letting go, can you talk a little bit about uh, dealing with the grief that comes up with that sometimes? Oh, there's going to be grief. <laughs> talk about it. So, we grieve because we loved. And it's, we, we grieved because we loved. We loved a person. We loved a way of life. We loved a station in life. We loved a story about ourselves. Uh, I, I, I loved my 20-year-old body. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, can you, I mean, we all, there is this sense of loss. It's normal to grieve, to make ourselves even question it is like, that's just not being human. If the grief opens you up to become more tender, 
then you will find in that opening up a space to discover something that is beyond grief. That is, that, is th that sweetness of spirit. Uh, I've noticed that some of the biggest losses I've experienced made me more compassionate and therefore able to connect with the world and what the world goes through. But grief, grief is normal. And if you pay attention and be still, at least for me, there's a part of me that is not grieving. That is that stillness within. And I think it was also Emerson who said, even though the finite is wrought and suffers, the infinite lies in silent repose. And there's that infinite part of all of us that we can, we can touch. And sometimes we touch it because we've become open. Okay, so I want to share with you something. We, so I'm not sure when we will be doing this, but in the future, in 2019, it won't be in 2018, we will be moving into the Green Lake Presbyterian Church at 6318 Linden Avenue North. And you will get a flyer on your way out with some pictures. Uh, a few things. They are waiting to move after the church that they have purchased, they have made their own. Then, when they move, we get to start making this place our own. So it is a domino effect, and we won't be moving right away. Because as, as many blessings as that particular facility has, it also has some other things. <laughs> that we need to move in and, and improve so that we really have a great experience there. Uh, so I'm telling you this, so don't be driving around and going through and saying, yeah, I think I changed the carpet. People live there still. <laughs> you know, they, they love that place. Uh, <laughs> do, if, you, if you want to do a drive-by, that's great. They're probably going to be used to it as another one. You know. <laughs> We should be, you know, all wear our Praise Well Together t-shirts and go as, a, go as a group. But, uh, field trip. Uh, so the process is, once we close, they still have an opportunity to rent back from us like we did with children's. So that they can really move with grace and ease. And then once they're out, we will start rehabbing making the place look different. As you see, the colors on the outside will probably paint. Um, the things will be happening. And uh, I just right now need to say uh, a marvelous work by our new home committee, marvelous work by a lot of the staff. It, they have been dedicated. We have kissed so many frogs. <laughs> but when I saw the pictures of the place while I was at Seabeck, I knew it was the place. And when we looked at it on Monday, right after Seabeck was over, I doubly knew this was the place. Lots of, lots of things need to be corrected but it really felt like it was a place. When I talked to Rod Hammer today after first service, he said, you know what, I did the same thing. Lots of things need to be corrected, but it's our place. It's really our place. And God is so funny because, God, well, it's just a personal thing. God wants me to walk because we were right by Gert Burke Gilman and now I'm right by Green Lake, so. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so let's just move into prayer. Let's do a prayer of gratitude. Just of gratitude. We are here together to discover together, to support each other in just enfolding in our possibility of listening to that spirit, being directed by spirit, being encouraged by spirit, 
being led and empowered by Spirit. And I give thanks that just as we are moving into our new home, which home means consciousness, each and every one of us can be part of that caravan, that part of that moving into a new awareness, a new consciousness of who we are and what is ours to do, what is ours to give, what is ours to express. And so I give thanks that we just allow ourselves to open up to the possibility that the God within wants to reveal to us. Take a deep breath and imagine yourself on a high plateau and the Spirit of God urging you to look at what's possible and saying, this is yours. All that the eye can see is yours. And know that the same spirit that leads you to see the promise will be with you as you eliminate all the naysayers within your mind. You're not alone. You've never been alone. You don't have to work for this. You don't have to improve yourself. By pure grace, the promise is given. And by pure grace, the negativity is eliminated. Thank you, sweet spirit. Thank you that we are together on this journey. Thank you for our new home. Ah, and so it is.